Reverend Dr. Mitri Bishara Mitri Konstantin El Raheb is a quintessential public theologian and public leader. He is the pastor of Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem, Palestine, a congregation of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. He is president of Dar El Kalima University College of Arts and Culture. Dr. Rahab received his theological training at the Hermansburg Mission Seminary in 1984 and earned his doctorate of theology from Phillips University in Marburg, Germany in 1988. He is the author of at least 16 books written in English, Arabic, and German. His latest book, Faith on the Edge of Empire, which the dean brought with him this morning, especially to get autographed, <laughs> was published by Orbis Books in 2014. Many of you, with a penchant for reading theological books at the seminary, will recognize the focus and commitment of Orbis Press having published the works of those like Gustavo Gutierrez, John Sabrino, and James Cohn, to name just a few. Dr. Raheb was one of the signatories of the 2009 Kairos Palestine document, a moment of truth, a word of faith, hope, and love from the heart of Palestinian suffering. Dr. Rahab's first well-received work, however, was I Am a Palestinian Christian, which was published by Fortress Press in 1995. The work was released not long after what has now become the disappointment of the Oslo Accords. This book opened the eyes of many in North America to the fact that not only were there Palestinian Christians living in the Holy Land, but there were Palestinian Lutherans, and that they had a particular voice and opinion about life under occupation. Pastor Rahab is a third-generation Protestant whose orphaned grandfather in the then Ottoman Empire was taken into the famous German Schneller School and Orphanage in 1868. But prior to his relationship with these German missionaries, Pastor Rahab's grandfather was, like many other Palestinian Christians before him, members of the Arabic-speaking Greek Orthodox Church, remnants of the ancient Byzantine Empire. Like so many other Middle Eastern Christians, when they are often asked out of curiosity by well-meaning but often ignorant visiting North Americans, when and how they had converted to Christianity, his response might sound something like this. After the Holy Spirit descended on our land on the day of Pentecost, <laughs> we converted sometime between then and the third century. In his writings, Dr. Rahab has continued to reflect on his specific social, political, and religious context as a Palestinian Christian theologian who has spoken out about the living stones in the Holy Land, 
the Palestinian people, living under a variety of empires and occupations. It is from within this context that this pastor and this theologian has responded creatively with a message of nonviolent hope. In 1995, Dr. Rahab founded the International Center of Bethlehem to create opportunities for international and intercultural exchange to bring pilgrims to the Holy Land and experience Palestinian hospitality. From there came the Dar el Kalima school, what we might call a charter school, of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. From this was created Dar el Kalima University, the first Christian Palestinian university to open its doors to all whose students are predominantly Muslim. Then there was the creation of the DR Corporation, the intent of which is to provide avenues for those who have been voiceless to speak out, to help Palestinians, quote, from a stance of reactivity to one of proactivity, from being victims to being visionaries, from waiting to creating, and from surviving to thriving. Of all the entrepreneurial opportunities that have been birthed through the ministries of Pastor Rahab, the one that has demonstrated his and his members creative, spirit-led energies for me was one such project begun in 2002. As a result of the Israeli invasion of Bethlehem during the Second Intifada, the church and compound of Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem was hit by tank shells and shrapnel due to airstrikes. Many of the buildings were damaged and destroyed as part of the war. One member of the congregation there, Samar, a then 38-year-old wife and mother of two, began collecting the broken glass littered around the compound. She began to refashion the bits and pieces of broken glass into angels, Christmas angels. The church newsletter that December recorded the following. The broken glass pieces are a sign of the brokenness of our world and it is also the reason for God to incarnate. Through his incarnation, God brought the divine and the human back together. God picked what seems to be worthless and hopeless and transformed it into a beautiful and whole creation. It is this incarnation which took place here in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, which gives us the strength to continue to look for broken lives and hopes and to transform them through art into angels, messengers of justice, peace, and dignity. Those initial glass angels were sent to churches in Norway for Christmas in 2002, where the people of Palestine shared the bright light of Christ through their own troubled darkness. One can now purchase Bethlehem nativity figurines made of recycled glass 
from Palestine. It is this razor's edge vicissitudes of his time that has placed the Reverend Dr. Mitri Raheb in his context. But it is his calling to ministry as a pastor, teacher, and theologian that has led him to creative public leadership. It is fitting that we welcome here this day as we commemorate and send out these our own public theologians. Dr. Raheb, welcome. Atlam was Atlam. Thank you, David. Um, this was really a well-researched paper. Uh, I learned so many new things about myself. Uh, <laughs> your excellences, members of the Board of Trustees, your Grace, Bishop Burkat, dear President Luz, dear Dean Sebastian, dear faculty members, dear graduates, spouses, parents, and friends. What a special day. This is the day that the Lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it. I could feel the excitement when the graduates stood up, the pride and the joy of the graduates. Finally, the day has come. Years of hard work are bearing fruits and shall be harvested. And it is not only your friends, partners, and classmates that are rejoicing with you today. God himself is. What advice can I give you? And I live thousands of miles away in Bethlehem. I mean, Bethlehem, Palestine, not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, right? <laughs> What insight can I share with you? And you have been studying hard at this prestigious seminary where you exploited the width and the depth of the sacred text, its context then and now. What advice can I give to you? And you have been trained to assume leadership and to serve God and his people in this world. After a lot of discerning, I decided to share with you my story, my personal story. You see, stories are very important. The Bible, in fact, is nothing but one long story with different episodes. And by the way, that Bible did not originate in the Bible Belt. <laughs> Thanks, God. <laughs> but in Palestine, our story as Palestinians is a continuation of that long story. That story has been silenced for too long. Our story has been pushed aside. But our forefathers faced all the recurring empires, not with weapons, but with their story. It was that one story of Jesus, born in Bethlehem, crucified and risen in Jerusalem, that changed the world. So today I would like to share with you my story Looking back at almost 30 years in ministry, I found three important lessons I learned in life dur during those years of service in church and society that I would like to share with you today. The first lesson. I still remember 
when I graduated from Germany and returned to Palestine. I was the first in our church to get a doctorate and a doctorate from Germany. You know, people think German doctorate are really special. <laughs> you can imagine how proud I was. I thought, now I come back to Palestine with all the answers. Now I return with great wisdom and knowledge. I returned in May 1987, and six months later, the first intifada or uprising began. Clashes between Israeli soldiers and Palestinian kids were happening just outside our parsonage. Church elders were jailed by the Israeli military without trial. Members of our youth group were injured. And at several Sundays, I had to stop preaching because the sound of shooting behind me was so loud that I could not continue. I found myself in a context I was not prepared for. I was not trained in the seminary to deal with a context like this that wasn't part of a New Testament or Old Testament or systematic theology. I was not ready for a time like this. I came back with many great answers. But the problem was that no one in Bethlehem was asking the questions to those answers. I had great ideas, but people were not listening to them. I had to listen to where people were and what their needs and real issues were. Listening is the most important tool for anyone in ministry. Listening to what people say or often don't say. Reading between the lines and listening with the heart are the most important tools you take with you to the world. You are called to serve God in the age of marketing, where people want to sell all kinds of stuff that people need or often actually don't need. The gospel that you will carry with you is not another product you offer to people. You are called to serve, and you can't serve if you don't listen to where people are what their real needs are, what is bothering, hurting, or exciting them. You see, I wrote several books without listening to where people were. I wrote them with the tools I learned at seminary in Germany. They were good, but I came later to realize that what, why, while writing them, I was dancing to the rhythm of 19th century European organ music. <laughs> While our people were dancing to the beat of the drum. It took me several years to figure this out. But I came to realize that the most important thing I brought from the university were the tools and not the ready answers the tools to listen, to analyze, to reflect, and to better serve. I came to realize that the most important training I got at school was not so much the stuff I learned, but the desire to keep learning, to continue working on myself, and to go on with developing my listening skills. The art of listening with the heart is the first important lesson I learned and that I hope might be of help to you. The second lesson. I finished university and came back to Bethlehem. I was still, believe it or not, only 24 years old. 
and had lots of dreams. The reality, however, was something else. I was asked to serve in my own home church where I grew up. My predecessor was just elected bishop and the pastoral post there became vacant. The congregation wanted so much to have me at that time, and they are still paying the price up until this day. <laughs> Christmas Lutheran was a very small church that was dying. The church has stopped to be relevant to its members and to the community at large. Then there was the political context, the uprising, a time of unrest, fear, and upheaval. The challenges were immense, the need overwhelming. And I said, why, Lord? Why here? Why now? Why me? I had my own idea, and it wasn't that cool. And yet, I had no idea what the Lord had in mind for me. The Lord who taught me to listen taught me also to see with new eyes. I listened to the need of the people around me, but slowly I started seeing their gifts. They brought with them a wealth on gifts. They were just waiting for someone to discover their gifts, to nurture them, and to put it to work. They were eager to develop those skills. They were thirsty to be asked to serve, and they were ready to be empowered. I started seeing around me many people with immense potential, excellent education, great passion, perseverance and will. They were just waiting to be asked to join, to join the vision to be of use, and to put their talent into service. In that context, I learned my second lesson. I learned to see differently. Instead of being paralyzed by the immense challenges, constraints, and obstacles that we are living in as Palestinians, the Lord gave me eyes to see people with their potentials. Slowly, the focus moved from looking at the challenges to discover the endless opportunities that are there for service and the great potential that is out there for outreach. It is often that we sit waiting and hoping for the perfect world to come, the perfect job, the perfect fit, and so we miss to see the potential that is just waiting to be unlocked. From my own experience, I can tell you that there are no challenge without an embedded opportunity. It is easy to be paralyzed by the immense challenges of this world so that we lose focus. But immense challenges bring with them endless possibilities. All we need are the eyes to see those, to see the potential of people around us, and to ask them to join in service. I always remind people that we are not the Messiah. We are not the ones who are going to fix all the problems of this world. If we think this of ourselves, we will be burned out in ministry. But once we see the potential of people around us, we can delegate. We can work as a team. We can think together. I keep reminding our people that it is crucial to know what is our own calling and what might be the calling of others around us. But the most important thing is to know what is definitely not our calling. <laughs> Often, we are tempted to think that we have to do this and that, 
to be here, there, and everywhere. And we have difficulty in saying no, because we might believe that the world will not be saved without us. But remember that our Messiah came long time ago. And we know this as a fact because he was born in our town. So I know what I'm speaking about, right? <laughs> he accomplished our salvation and that of the whole world. He called us for a very specific ministry. And he is calling all those around us to engage with their gifts into making this world a better place. Not more and not less. So you need eyes that can see. See the potential of people around you. Eyes to see the gifts that are wa waiting to be discovered, nurtured, and called to service. Let me move to the last and third lesson I learned. 28 years ago, I started my ministry as pastor of Christmas Lutheran Church. Seven years later, we felt a call to reach out beyond the walls of the church to the larger community. Were all parishioners happy? Not at all. Many were saying, why bother? Often congregation wants to be, I think, they want to be just pampered by their pastor. They want all the attention. They think, why bother? Why jeopardize the core work of the church with outreach? But outreach is the core of ministry. The church in Bethlehem was dying because the church there stopped for a while to reaching out and to being relevant to the community. In 1995, we took the decision to start an outreach ministry. And I still remember how we started, with eight chairs from the 50s, one desk from the 60s, an old typewriter, you remember these old typewriters, and $327. What started really as a one-man show, where basically I was the man and I was the show at that time, <laughs> developed to become the third largest enterprise in Bethlehem, with over 110 people working, with over 2,500 members and with over 60,000 people participating in our outreach programs every year. In the last 20 years, we opened a brand new school, a conference and cultural center, the first Lutheran University College in the Middle East, just to name few. If you would have told me back in 1987 how this ministry would grow and expand, I would have laughed like Sarah when she was told she is getting pregnant with 90. Yet the hardest lesson for me to learn was this. Every time I thought our vision was bold and big, the Lord had to show me it was too small. Too small compared with the need and too small compared with what he had in mind for us. I had to learn to leave some room for God in our plans because his plans for us are better and greater than what we can imagine, desire or dream for. We have to leave room for him. This was not always easy. I remember in 2002 when Israel invaded the little town of Bethlehem, when they occupied our center and used it as their military headquarters for three days. And before leaving, they made sure to leave over half a million dollars in destruction. I saw what we built so hard over seven years was partly destroyed in three days. There were moments like this when I had to go back to my Lord and say, Lord, look, this was not my idea in the first place. 
you better figure a way out. <laughs> and he did. He never failed us. He gave us more than we could have imagined. When you graduate today and leave this fine institution, be assured that the Lord be with you at all times. This is my story and my advice. Listen with the heart to where people are. Look for the potential that is waiting to be unlocked and leave some room for God to do his work. He will give you ears to hear and he will give you eyes to see and he will be there for you at all times. And one last advice, please dare to share your story. Your story is important. It is powerful. And it is just a continuation of that one long story that started in Bethlehem. This is the day that the Lord has made extra for you. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Congratulations, graduating class 2015.